Hannah Monroe, huge honor. I have been on your show. I remembered it. I just, you have a ton of energy. If CFO Bookshelf had a co-host, and I'm not just saying this, you would be the perfect co-host. You would be, you're the kind of person I would expect to see like in the U.S. on the Today Show or a morning show. To me, you've got that it factor. Am I embarrassing you? Yeah, if you can't see me on camera, because obviously this is a podcast, but I am definitely blushing right now, Mark. I am definitely blushing. I can't help it. And by the way, we are recording this in the U.S. two days before the King's coronation uh, in England. And I'm going to play the dumb American here. What's the appropriate thing to say? Do we say congratulations to, to people like you? <laughs> Do you know what? I, this is really bad. Is I'm actually not sure what the uh, the protocol is for for saying so. Happy coronation, maybe. But do you know what? In the in the UK, the bit that we do when we have uh, an event like this is we celebrate. So there's street parties happening. It's an excuse to eat lots of great cake um, and drink cups of tea in a very true English way. Well, I'm not embarrassed to say that I've watched every season of The Crown. So I know my history a little bit. It's been 60 years since there's been a coronation like this. And I just think that is uh, amazing. So are we going to be, I don't think we'll be waiting another 60 years for the next one, right? No. And um, again, you know, I think everyone in, you know, even in the UK has their opinion on um, the royals and the, the queen, but um, you know, I think one of the the amazing things is that we've got such a legacy behind us. Like, you know, Queen Elizabeth was an amazing and very inspiring individual for me personally. Um, and uh, I think she's passed down a lot of her values to, you know, her sons and her grandsons. So, you know, hoping that we, uh, you know, won't be that long before we get a, a, a King William and maybe a Queen Tate. So we're going to talk a little bit more about your podcast, but I want to bring it up just a little bit here before we dive into our topic, the book we're going to be talking about, but you are the the host of CFO 4.0 uh, podcast. Uh, how's that going? That sounds like an interesting show. Of course, I, I, and I've been, I've been fortunate to have been on it too. <laughs> See, it's all about the guests right mark as you know fabulous guess equals great show um but uh no i genuinely love it it's been it's been so popular recently i don't know what's happened i don't know whether there's a whole new wave of people coming through and watching listening to podcasts but it's been it's been so lovely to have feedback and i always say this and you must experience this as well mark it's one of the hardest things about podcasts is that there's no immediate reaction what you get is messages and things afterwards which is lovely and it keeps you going but um, one of the challenges is because I love speaking to people and having conversations is that not knowing what people think and being able to be in the moment. So um, I've been fortunate enough in the last um, last couple of months to have lots of messages and reach outs from people, um, which has been incredibly exciting. I can relate to every single thing you just said. So our topic, our topic is a fascinating book. It's by Derek Sivers. And I'm, I'm, he's the kind of guy that I wouldn't be surprised if, if you, and I would say more of a U.S., uh, people living in the U.S., uh, he's a guy who created CD Baby going back to 1997. They didn't even have PayPal back then. So he creates this little, in fact, he's an accidental entrepreneur. Uh, he wanted to sell his music. He's an indie uh, producer. And he wanted to be able to sell his CDs outside the normal channels, a website. So he does it successfully. And then he has a friend that says, can you do that for me? And then another. And before he knows it, he has a business. And so CD grew, uh, Baby grew to where he eventually sold it about 10 years later for $22 million. So that's kind of the backstory in case anyone's not familiar with the story. The name of the book is called Anything You Want. I'm dying to ask you, what were your first impressions of the book? I, I can't wait to hear this. 
So do you know the bit I loved about it was the fact that um, he was so reluctant to take on new customers. <laughs> do you know? And that was that was for me is that um, we talk a, we talk a lot about purpose driven businesses and purpose driven finance, right? But this is someone that genuinely lived that purpose, and for me that resonated throughout the book. Um, and for such a small book, it has an amazing impact in terms of what it means to be custom centric, what it means to really understand your core value as a business and doing the right thing by the customer, all of which I love. Like I live, that's a whole part of why I run my business and why I do what I do. So, yeah, I loved it. And he's such a character as well, isn't he? So I was going to say, you mentioned small book. 88 pages. So for the people who don't like to read, it's like, it's again, it's less than a hundred pages. I'm going to ask you the hardest question. And if you say pass, I'm okay with that. Why do you think, why do you think I picked this book? Oh, and I was thinking, I was just like, why, you know, why this one? I think for me, it's amazing how much value is in such a small book, right? And and I think the term small book, big personality really sums this one up. Um, but I, I think if I was thinking about why would I recommend this to a CFO, I think in finance, we spend a lot of time thinking about numbers, about the monetary value of what we're doing. And actually what, um, what Derek is able to encapsulate is is that it's about more than money and it's about how do you as a CFO have that entrepreneurial mindset um, and actually tie the value that you're bringing and the customer centricity that he talks about into your work as a finance business partner. That's what I, I don't know. Have I got it right, Mark? But you got to tell me, like, how on the money am I? Well, there, there is no wrong answer. There is no wrong answer, but... I just want to say that when I started my practice, I was a snob. Now, some people may say, well, you still are, dude. <laughs> but Only your best friend do that, Mark. <laughs> the, the, so when I got started in my practice serving more than one CEO, I just assumed they know what I bring to the table and what I'm doing is important. But here's what I did not do early on 20 plus years ago, I was not entering the conversation that was already existing in the mind of that human being, whether it was a woman, a male, young person, middle age, older, I was not entering that conversation, that conversation of frustration, torment, anguish, you name it. I, I could not relate to them emotionally. And as I'm reading this book, I'm getting to feel, it's like I'm getting emotional, I'm getting angry. And it's like, this is a great little book to understand. Here's the life of a CEO. Don't forget that. And that's why I like to give this little book. To me, it's the junior version of Shoe Dog, because there are times I was pulling my hair out with what Phil Knight went through. So I I like this book, Hannah, because it helps us to realize the human aspect of running a business, the ups and the downs, usually more downs than there are ups. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and you can definitely say that this book has that, that human aspect, right? So he, all of his feelings, he's very honest. And that's what I love about it as well is that I think sometimes when people talk about their experiences, they kind of sugarcoat them. They kind of, they they put a spin on them that suits whatever purpose they have. Whereas he's just very, it feels like he's being incredibly honest about his experience and whether that reflects well on him or not. And that I think is a is a rare find in a book. So I understand why you love it. He, he, yeah, he, he's pure. He definitely pulls back the curtain and says, here's what it was like. And I truly, I believe him. I, I, He's not afraid to share the flaws. I do want to hit a couple of, I don't know if you want to call them high points, low points. Uh, as a financial guy, what did you think about the part of the story where he pays his dad back 
$3.3 million. I, I was, uh, I, now I've read this about eight, nine times. I listen to it every year after listening to it several times when I first got it a number of years ago. I'm at the point where I can now laugh at that part. But he had to pay his dad back, $3.3 million. Ludicrous. What did you think when you got to that part of the book? I, do you know what? I felt incredibly sorry for him because I think it's so easy as an entrepreneur and a person going through rapid growth, rapid change to, to not think about the details, right? We make decisions as we go through in the name of let's just get stuff out fast. It's not worried about, oh, that's so small. It doesn't matter. And, and I think it's a shout out, isn't it? For everyone going into a new role that's working with fast growing and small businesses, the details do matter. And if, you know, and at the end of the day, that like you said, a three point three point two million pound mistake, um, you know, just not quite thinking through some of the decisions that he made, huge impact. But I felt so sorry for him. And I may get part of this wrong, Hannah, the, the facts, but my understanding, and he, I think he left a couple of things out, but very early in his business, he needed a loan. And so like a lot of young people, who signs off, who guarantees the mom or the dad. In this case, it was his dad, but there, by the way, there was some collateral to it. It meant that I think he got like 90 some odd percent of the business. And there, there was a small technicality when he went to, it had something to do with the way he set up his bank account. Well, when he went to move his bank account, they said, well, you don't own the business. And he did not know that. And that's one of the little details you're talking about. Now, here's the thing. For a business that already has a full-time CFO, stuff like this is not going to happen. But you take a small business where they don't have that resource, stuff like this is going to happen. And, and I, I, again, I, part of me cried when I got, as I was like, why is this happening? I, I really did. And then I'm thinking, I'm being judgmental here, Hannah. I'm thinking about the dad. Should the dad just said, hey, it's okay, son. You know, don't, don't pay me back. I, did that run through your mind a little bit? It's hard, isn't it? And and there is always this challenge, right? So I'm, so, you know, I work, or I used to work with my dad. He's well retired now. But um, there is something about families working together, right? And and kind of the way, and the same with friends. I think the same principle applies with friends, right? You kind of have to go into business treating your friend or your family um, as if you were a stranger, right? Because the problem is, is when, things come to, when things like this come up, you need to have thought through the implications because people won't always do in the moment what you hope and feel they should. Um, and so, you know, lesson learned is always to say, right, what is the situation now? Um, it's hard, isn't it? You know, it's like it's like going into like getting married and having a prenup. You hope that the worst never happens, but at some point you need to protect yourself. You need to protect, you know, your your family. And so, you know, I think that's what a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they're so focused on building the business they haven't they haven't thought about protecting it. You mentioned his humility a few minutes ago. Do you mind if I read a couple of quotes from the book? Because th th these lines are, I don't want to say the word profound, but to me, they, they strike a positive chord uh, to the heart. He says, never forget why you're really doing what you're doing. He goes on to add, are you helping people? Are they happy? Are you happy? Are you profitable? Isn't that enough? I can hear him saying that right now. And I want to read one more line because I, as you were talking earlier, I almost thought you were alluding to this. It's on page two. He says, most people don't know why they're doing what they're doing. They imitate others, go with the flow and follow paths without making their own. Derek made his own path. And again, I love the humility and the authenticity of him as a business owner, as he was running CD Baby. Want to add to that? I think there's a lot of things in that that really strike me. I think as CFOs, sometimes we don't 
I think when we're going for new jobs or we're going for new roles, we don't always think through why we're going for that role. Um, and I do believe that, you know, when you're talking about why he started it in the first place, you know, are we making enough money? Is it right for me? Is it right for the business? And I, I think those are all great questions every CFO should ask themselves before they go into a new role. Like, why are you going for this new role? What is it that you want out of it? What is it that you feel that you can bring to that business? Do you believe in the product that we're offering? Do you understand and believe in the principles? And if the answer is no, you know, you would have, you, you kind of need to take a step back and decide whether this is the role for you. And obviously, you know, there's always financial implications of any decision, but those are questions I think every CFO should ask themselves before they go into it to any business. Do I like the people I'm working with? Do I do I believe in that entrepreneur? So yeah, he's, you know, as you say, it's very um, humble, um, but I also he asks really good questions of both himself and others, I think. Exactly. One other big idea that I pull from the book And I think this is going to apply more to businesses, say, maybe under $20 million. I think once you get beyond 2025, and there is no magical number, uh, but I I don't think you're going to suffer from the the same issue that that, uh, Derek Sivers did. But it's this whole issue, uh, this whole concept of of workflow in the business. And there's, there's been so much written about documenting your workflows. And my thought is, so what? What are you going to do? with that documentation, you know, he had a lot of his business documented, but there's a story in the book where he had somebody, I think is up in, uh, I think in a warehouse up in Washington and things got backed up and this young man did not raise the red flag and it caused this big backlog and it started to hurt, tarnish the image of CD Baby. For CD Baby, one of their core values was from the from the indie producer, the the you know the the artist. Here's a CD. We'll get this up on the website quickly. Well, that wasn't happening, even though he had the process he documented, finally had to let him go. So there there is a pragmatic, tangible concept of it's not just documentation you got to have the right people who are going to follow these processes from beginning to end. Did, did I get that right in your opinion? Yeah. And he used the phrase uh, delegate, but validate, I think was the phrase. Yes. He used. So yes. that whole, you know, you can give people a process, but fundamentally it's your responsibility to check that they're following it. So it's not just about putting processes in place. The bit I took away was what the checks and the balances that come through that. So if you think of a CFO going into a new role, you might make sure that the processes are there for finance to follow, but where are the checks and balances that you have? You can't just trust, yeah, trust but validate or something was the phrase that he used. It was. You can't just trust that you're going to do that. You have to make sure that you have like ways to raise red flags when things don't come out. So there was, there was so many lessons in this, but I love, that's a really, for me, that was a really good one. And it, and again, it's, it's great hearing this from a CEO who was at the time, I, I, I can't even imagine where his head was. I mean, he had to be frantic. I mean, he ended, he ended up firing him uh, and then took over himself until he got caught up. And then he had to rethink this and, and he applied what you just shared. Uh, I want to pull out three. If Derek were our coach, if he were coaching us, I think I pulled out maybe possibly three ideas he might share with us. And if you have a few others, Hannah, please share. But there, there was one part of the book. I think when I heard it, I probably glossed over it, but when I saw it on my Kindle version, I thought this is great. They got to the point to where when they would send out a CD to a customer, they would write this note, your CD has been gently, and there'd be like three paragraphs of what they did. I just thought, this is so, this is so CD baby. This is so Derek Siverish. Uh, I just thought that was amazing. Uh, there's a takeaway there, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. That that you know. Um, but did you do you remember the bit where he, they um, what was it they put in the squids? 
Oh, uh, they, so, yes. <laughs> that, that made me giggle. So that absolutely made me laugh. Um, surprise and delight, I think is the phrase. Yes. Um, but I thought that was the same thing. So it's all about over-delivering. What was your thoughts? What I like, I, one of my, I have three terms that I love for any CEO that I serve. And, and one of my favorite words, some, a word, a term that's important to me is authenticity, which means I don't like people going out and just copy. Uh, we, we have enough copying out there already. Uh, we, we have enough QSRs, quick serve restaurants in my little city. We have enough, let's do something different. And I, I like this because they were being them. They were being true to themselves. They didn't read this in a book. They didn't read this out of uh, Fast Company or Inc. Magazine. They thought of it themselves. And that's why this is special to me. It's like they were true to themselves. They were being authentic. That's what, that was, again, my big takeaway. And like I said, parts of this were funny as, as you, if you're reading this for the first time, you're going to agree, like, this is good stuff. There is one other, I want to turn, so I want to move over to another idea that, that Derek would probably coach on. Hire lightly, fire lightly. I'm going to ask your opinion. What does that mean, Anna? So he really focuses in on personal recommendations for new staff. So he's like, you know, you're not going to be able, I think it's interesting, isn't it? His perception, and I and I agree with this in some way, especially with traditional hiring practices, that even if you try to have a good hiring process, it you know, you don't really understand and know somebody until they're in role. Um, and you, you, you know, so you might as well give them the opportunity. But then he tied that with the, but also everyone needs time to learn. So give people the opportunity to, um, to correct. But I found it really interesting that he had that philosophy. And as we talked about earlier, he fired the guy that didn't deliver on the value really quickly as soon as he found out. So I thought that was an interesting contrast is that maybe, you know, in terms of his philosophy was that, you know, how much checks and balances have, you know, gone in place. And yeah. And then obviously he said that as a, as a philosophy. So I thought that was an interesting contrast. When I was reading through this part of the book, when he mentions that I couldn't help but thinking of a retailer in your company that I have the utmost respect for. And I think uh, this is my fault that I do this and I do this frequently. I think I put an S on the end of the name. Is it Timpson or Timpson's retail there in England? They're the shoe repair and key cutting store. I'm pretty sure it's the plural. You've got me, me thinking now. I'm sure it's Timpson. I'm, I'm sorry, but I think that organization is, I'm putting them on a pedestal and I would bet they're the same way. Uh, they do hire lightly. They hire cleverly. It's very clever. There are no personality uh, profiles. In fact, a number of people they hire right out of prison. But I would just say, if you're looking to understand hire lightly, fire lightly, just do a search on Timpson or with the S on YouTube, and you're going to find the patriarch, the son who's now taken over. It is, it is over the top. And by the way, we have done a show about them. We, we did not interview either of them, but we did a kind of a book club type uh, episode a few weeks ago. So anyway, if if you want to hear more, study. To I, I think they've got it nailed down. One last takeaway, and I don't know if Derek would bring this up, business coach. So I saw where he, he gave the name Jared Rose and question. So you talk to a lot of CFOs. Actually, I, I, work, I work more with CEOs than I do CFOs. Do you think, and by the way, I learned a long time ago, you never use the word you should with an entrepreneur. It takes an art. You have to be careful. Don't ever say the words you should to an entrepreneur. But 
should a CFO, and by the way, it could be a CMO. We've got marketers that listen to our show. We have HR people who listen. We have accountants. Should professionals have a coach like Derek did? I think that everybody in a senior role should have a coach, is my personal opinion, right? I think everyone at a junior level should have a mentor within the organization. But I think everyone at a senior level needs somebody outside, right? Because unfortunately, you know, it can be quite lonely. And so very often people have different agendas within an organization, whether you you know, whether it's intentional or unintentional, you know, there's there's always a lot of politics, especially when you get to large businesses. So I think one of the wonderful things about a business coach, and certainly and if you get the right business coach, they will ask you good questions to make you think. And I think anybody that makes you think and makes you question and helps you orientate yourself is just is is, is adding huge value. So that that's my opinion. What's your thoughts, Mark? Uh I, w- I want to say I like your answer. We'll roll with that. I've, I've had a lot of time to think about this. If you had asked me that question in my first senior controllership position, I would have said, no, I'll go get help when I need it. Well, now looking back, I would change my mind. I see the value of it. I I think with technical skills, I think, Again, this is opinion, but I think I'm close to being right. With technical skills, if you have a gap, you're going to know it and you're going to find the answers to those technical skills where it gets tricky. And you just, you alluded to this. You've got the one-to-one relationship with the CEO. And sometimes that can be, that, to me, that's the hardest part in my work is, is trying to work with many different personalities who are leaders. So you got that relationship you got the one-to-many relationship with those in your inner circle, your department. Then you've got the senior leadership team. That can be nuanced. And then you've got that one-to-one relationship with yourself. And that's the self-confidence, the resilience, the grit. And when you package all those three together, you use the word that I could not pick a better word. It can be lonely. So when you look at those three buckets, yes, it makes a lot of sense. One last comment. I hope I'm not talking too much. I do not put myself out there to be a coach. But what happens is I will have people email me, LinkedIn, hey, can you mentor and coach me? And it depends. It's going to be, it depends. But in every relationship I have, when I get to the conversation, I will ask them on a scale of one to 10, would you recommend this conversation to somebody else? I'm not looking at the score. And by the way, they, they're, they're always overly generous, but it's what they say is special. It's like, oh, this old guy really did help. So when you ask me that question, I'm trying to answer it from the people I've been mentoring. And I'm learning that, yes, there is value because They're getting information they'll never get from a textbook or from a YouTube video. They're getting some tacit knowledge they never thought about. That was my long answer. I apologize. But it was a great one. And I think there's also, I think, especially in a CFO role, right, there is a perception that the CFO needs to be calm and in control, right? So that often means that you have to hide and, you know, be in some ways less honest about how you're feeling about things. You you always have to be the calm, the steady of the ship, the person that's in control that knows what's going on. It's going to manage you through a situation. And if you think about what's happened in the last four years, like those CFOs that have done that are the ones that stepped up. But that is an exhausting place to be because you have to be that person to the CEO, to the CMO, to the board, to the chair. You can't let yourself um, talk about your emotions and how you're feeling and how to cope with the situation. And I think for me, that's why a CFO of all people is the one that really needs that coach because they're, and I would say probably the same about the CEO because they are the one that everyone else looks to, to guide the ship and to be, and they can't be as honest 
about sometimes how they're feeling without impacting others and they take all of that on themselves so slight perspective on that. i have three final questions real quick questions number one scale of one to five is yeah that's the amazon ratings five stars one to five what's your what's your amazon rating for this book oh definitely a five right five. you know if you want value and entertainment and if you think about the time it takes you to read it the roi on this for any cfos that are listening the roi on this book is fabulous so when you take all those things into account in terms of what you'll learn how quickly you're going to learn it and how you're going to feel whilst consuming it. It's got to be a five, if not a six, right? We can sneak a bit, a bit outside the Amazon range. Question number two, who do you recommend this book for? for? So whether it's my personal perspective is that I'm going to be open and honest, Mark, is that I'm not sure I would have recommended this to a CFO. So I found it really interesting that you suggested this, but do you know, I would recommend this to any entrepreneur, right? Because he, as somebody who has started a business um, and, and you know, built a business, actually, I want, um, he, he echoes things that I've experienced and things I wish I'd known. But I would say anyone that's in that growth stage of a business. So whether you're a CFO and a startup, I could totally see that. Or whether you're a CEO or somebody that's in a management role in a startup, I think there's so much to learn. So that's who I would recommend it. Somebody that's in a business that's about to grow fast, what are the things you needed to know before you started growing? Last question about the book. Now, you may have to think about this. There may be a pause that we can surgically remove. But I think you're going to like this question. If you could spend about three minutes with Derek Sivers, you've now read the book, you get to ask him one question. So I'm, 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 I'm trying to talk slow because you've got that look. You're, you're, you're already thinking. The question is, what would you ask him with that one question? Take your time. I think I would ask him what, because he's very focused on him and a business, right? So when it comes to building the business and it comes to people, what would you have done differently? You took my question. That's, oh, did I? I did. <laughs> you, and so you did not know I was going to ask that question. Do you want to? No, you, I didn't. <laughs> so I, I would have worded it differently. So I would have cheated. I would have cheated. I would, it would, my question would have turned into two. My question would have been, Derek, would you, would you have done this? all over again, if you had the chance to do this all over again. And again, this is back in 1997, not today, because we have different platforms, di different technology, di different market, di different, just different. So it'd be back in 1997. Derek, would you do this again? And if not, what would you have done differently? You, so you, I, I, when you said that, I thought, how did, what a great question. So. Thank you. Hey, thinking, thinking alliance. Yeah, because I think it is interesting, isn't it? He he talks about what he did, but I also think that some of the success that he saw was in the people that he hired, or maybe some of the reasons he wasn't as successful, the people he didn't hire. And I think it's always interesting because, um, especially when you're growing a business, I think, yeah, that that's an interesting question to ask. So, yeah, hey. Um, it's uh, thinking along the same lines there, Mark. <laughs> I didn't even mean to. <laughs> well, before we wrap up, and again, I cannot thank you enough, Hannah. Going back to CFO Ford Auto, I heard this when we first met and got introduced. But what's the what was the origin story 
of that show. How, how did this, how did your show come to be? So it was, it was kind of a culmination of a lot of things, right? So um, when I, so I've always been a massive learner. I've always loved learning, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the person that consumes like three books, four books in a day and doesn't even bat an eyelid. So um, I had the opportunity to go on a course about um, sustainable leadership and leadership and change. Um, and actually what amazed me is that when we talk about technology and people become consultants, you look at the courses that they go on and you look at how people train consultants and a lot of it is about, do you know what the software does? This is how do you get a company and a finance team to move from old way to new way using your technology? Um, and so for me, I was, I've just, I had gone through this um I'd gone through this amazing course, then lockdown hit, right? And we had all of these wonderful challenges around people. Um, and I was having conversations remotely with people and trying to share some of that knowledge that I'd experienced. And, and I thought, actually, um, there's a lot of people that can't afford my help at the time because it was obviously a challenging financial time for a lot of people. How do I get more knowledge out into the world of finance and the world of transformation? without um, having to charge people that, you know, can't, either can't afford it or, you know, can't get the budget signed off to access it. So that is what it was. It was genuinely like I'd have these three things. So the learning that I built and the, and kind of, sort of learning the science behind change. Then we had lockdown and I had, I was speaking to clients and, and I wanted to help them, but they didn't have the budget. And then I was like, well, lockdown's here. Um, what can I do? that's you know something different um and yeah a little bit more free time than normal and I started the podcast and to be fair I don't think I think for the first six months I didn't even realize anybody was listening I was just putting this out there and hoping that it was resonating and then all of a sudden it sort of it blew up I think it's about six seven months in so yeah that's 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 where it started it was just purely a way to to help like it generally was a way to help people um, how bring knowledge into finance because we are going through so much change. I was on a webinar and someone asked what what's been your favorite show, and it's like that's hard to answer because you you don't want to say that because you've had all these other people you've talked to, so I'm not going to ask you about your favorite show. But is there something that has there been a topic? or some situation has come up that meant a lot to you in these interviews that you do from week to week? There was actually one situation in the last few months, actually, that was really exciting for me. Um, so I had an email from a young lady um, who had worked in finance and she messaged me and said, look, you don't know who I am, <laughs> which I was like, no, I don't know who you are. Um, but I've been listening to your podcast for the last 12 months and it's inspired me to, to go for a new role in a transformation, a transformation role. Um, and she messaged me and she said, you know, and she was asking about, um, you know, ideas and things and things to think about. But what was lovely is that she'd been listening to people. And, and this is why I, I tried to mix up the types of content. People that were, were both going through transformation have been through that experience. And, and it had inspired her, and her to put a hand up and go, this is what I want to do. So if my podcast does that and it inspires people to look for new roles and transformation and change, then, hey, I think that's probably the best, the best um, response that I could have. And see, that's just the one person who's reached out. There are probably a hundred more where you don't know those stories, but it's had a big impact just, just listening to you. And by the way, I've not listened to every episode. I've listened to a handful. You have this gift, this natural gift of just putting people at ease. And it's it's a very conversational, uh, just listening to you and, and your guests. I again you've got you've got an it factor which I doubt you had to go through hardly any coaching for that. You are a natural 
uh, behind that mic. Again, that is my opinion, and I stand by it. Hey, one last question about your podcast. One last question about the, your show. What are people learning as a result of listening? And, and that and, and the reason I bring that up is in case no one's familiar with it, they may want to start subscribing. So what are your listeners getting out of your content? So I try to produce three types of content. So one is kind of thought leaders. So what is what is the world of finance talking about and how can I bring people in that can talk about those things? So, you know, talking to the AICPA or SEMA in the UK, um, what what are they seeing on kind of like the horizon for finance? What do we what do we need to be thinking about? So that's kind of like, are we clear on where we're going in finance? And that that's one piece. I think the second piece is about giving people reassurance that we're all in the same position. So that's why I love having CFOs on. So we can talk, I talk to them about the experience they've gone through, the learnings that they've got, because we don't always get to speak to people that have been doing this role um, and understand where they come from. So I love speaking to people about their journey as CFO, what they learned, what they wish they knew. Um, and that's one piece. And then third, and probably one of my my pet, one of my thing, one of my favorite things to do is that as a consultant, um, there's lots of things we do that we see as common sense, but actually can be magic to finance teams and other people. So what I've been trying to do is I have one one session a month where I, I talk about financial transformation. And what I try to do is bring together frameworks and things that a normal finance person, so somebody that um, in any you know a, in a in a role in a finance team can pick up that framework or that idea and go away and apply it in their role. So I like to think that with those three streams, we we kind of, we give people a view of the future, we help them understand the journey and not make the same mistakes others, but also feel like they're not alone. And then we give them practical tools and ways to think about what they're doing and um, that they can take away and apply. And hopefully, you know, you get to know and love transformation as much as I do. I always like asking authors to plug anything if there's something beyond your book for you, you've got the podcast. Is there anything else you want to plug about Hannah Monroe? Um, no, like if I'm, I would just ask if, you know, if you're interested in transformation, so a lot of, we have the podcast, but we also do a lot of live sessions on LinkedIn and I do share a lot of thoughts and ideas. So if you, you know, if you're listening to this and you, you would love to connect, reach out, um, and send a message. So I do, you know, I do share a lot on uh, LinkedIn as well as the podcast. And and you're you're open to LinkedIn connections, right? Absolutely. I think it's always great to connect, and um, and and I get a lot of people reaching out, and I'm you know, and saying hello, and it's lovely when people say that they've listened to a podcast or that you know, um, and hey, and you should message me if you uh, if you're listening to this and you fancy connecting, feel free, and just mention that you heard from from me on Mark's podcast. It'd be lovely to hear from you. Last question. You know, I'm going to ask this. Our 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 show has the word bookshelf in it. So I got to hear this from you several months ago, but now I'm going to ask you, what are some of your all time favorite books? And don't worry if it's not a business book, because some of my favorite books are not in the business genre. Oh, that's, oh, do you know what? That is genuinely one of the hardest questions, Mark. It is. Um, like, because, and I, I kid you not, I do read Crazy Maths. So one book I'm really enjoying at the moment, which is the business book, is called Radical Candor. I'm not sure uh, if you've read it. Yes, I have. I've been, it's, it's, it's been highly suggested to me. You need to reach out to that author uh, because some of the people that I've interviewed have mentioned that book and not just, not just non-finance people, but finance people. So it is on my to read list. I, have you already finished it, Hannah? Yeah, it's fabulous. It's really good. So that is definitely um, an interesting uh, a read. And I think their approach um, to how they talk about things. Um, and the, honestly, like that 
I could literally talk about that. That's definitely, you definitely need to do a podcast on that one, Mark. It's a fabulous book. Anything else? (laughs) So if you're talking um, non-business, what would I say? Um, So I, I love smart comedy. Like I think intelligent comedy is like one of these really rare things. So um, I'm going to choose a really girly book, I guess, but it's also one of my favorite author is Georgette Heyer. So if you like, if you enjoyed The Crown and you fancy a bit of humor, um, she does some cracking uh, Regency, historical Regency mysteries. And I always find them very, very clever. And the pictures she paints of the people in those uh, day and age is always very entertaining. Well, is she more regional than uh or does she have a global audience of readers? I, I'll look her up. I'll definitely look her up. Because, yes, I did like The Crown. I, I don't know if I should say this. Well, why not? I'm also a big fan of Downton Abbey. Uh, don't really care for the movies, yeah. but but I liked it. And are you laughing at You're not laughing at me of her saying that. Uh, I, <laughs> I think that's really good. Yeah. What about Bridgerton? It, I think of it as... Um, Georgette I'm, Heyer is a smart person. I'm, I'm too old for that show. I've 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 heard of it. I, I've I've seen some of the actors interviewed on on late night, and it just does not look to be my. I I, I have a dull, boring personality, so maybe that's why I don't watch it. So, well, I cannot I, imagine you being dull and boring, Mark. To be very fair. Well, again, this has been fantastic. Again, it's an honor to have you. I, again, I, I've, I've been on the other end. I'm, I don't necessarily enjoy being in. Can you relate? Now you're you're on the other side. You probably like asking the questions. But again, this has been very enjoyable. Th- thank you for this. Oh, thank you, Mark. Do you know what? This is probably, um, I found this incredibly relaxing. I was, but I also got to experience on the other side what my poor guests probably feel like. I was like really worried coming in. <laughs> so this has been very good for my personal development, but you made it, you do make it so easy, Mark. And, you know, everything you said about um, me being an actual interview, I have to say, you know, right back at you. This has been so easy and yeah, really enjoyable. So thanks, Mark. <laughs>